Right. Hello, everyone. My name is Sergey Rachenko. I'm professor of international politics at Cardiff University, and I will talk to you today about uh, accessing the Russian Foreign Ministry archives and the various things that you have to keep in mind uh, while you work there. Now, with this in mind, let me just go straight to my presentation. I will share a PowerPoint presentation with you. Okay, here we are. Um, without further ado, the archival situation in Moscow is very, very complicated. Depending on what you would like to focus on, you will want to go to different archives. Now, I will talk about foreign policy, Russian and Soviet foreign policy today. Um, uh, materials for that are not in any you know, just one specific archives, but are spread across the board. Uh, so, for example, we have federal archives uh, that, in, that including Ergaspi, or Ghani, Garf, and regional archives as well that are subordinated to the federal archive system. Uh, but you also have archives outside the federal archive system, including the so-called agency archives, like some of the military archives that are outside of Moscow in a place called Podolsk. Also, uh, foreign ministry archives that are in the center of Moscow and intelligence archives, the SVR archives, which you will not be able to access anyway. But if you're studying foreign policy, you can go to all these different archives uh, and compensate lack of access in one by getting access at a different archive. So for example, uh, by going to local regional archives, you can get a lot of materials from the center, especially for the 1980s. If you're interested in the 1980s, there, the late 1980s, there was at that time um, a greater openness and greater willingness by regional archives to retain important documents which have been settled there and are maybe more open than the stuff that you can get in Moscow, for example. Right, the key is to spread your activities widely because lack of access in one archive may be compensated by access elsewhere i.e. cross-references between uh, ABPRF and Ergani, and Ergani and regional archives, I already mentioned that. Right, uh, broadly about access. Uh, access is different depending on the archive in, in Moscow. Some archives you can easily get into. You just show up and you can, you can write a letter from, on, on your own behalf and you can access the archive this, the very same day. For example, GARF, this is how it works there. Other archives are much more bureaucratic and more difficult. Other archives you cannot access at all, like the intelligence archives and much more difficult to get into the military archives as well. But uh, uh, so, so the, the, the bottom line is you want to leave enough time for you to do your archival research in Moscow or indeed in the regions. The regions are usually a lot easier, a lot more open uh, in this regard. So I would say a minimum of two weeks for Ghani or Gaspi or Garf and a month or more at AVPRF. So it's not, you cannot do sort of like a helicopter archival visit like you can sometimes do in the US or in the UK where you would just come for a day and photocopy a bunch of documents and leave the same day. You just can't do that. Um, if you want to really get proper handle on the archival situation. Mostly you have to spend months there sometimes, maybe a couple of months really, to, to, get, um, uh, to get to the bottom uh, of the question that you're looking at. Right, so with this, turning now to AVPRF, Archiv Vnishni Politiki Rasiska Federacy, or the Archive of the of Foreign Policy of Russian Federation that houses materials uh, that cover broadly in 1917 to the present, materials that are before that, before 1917, are in the uh, foreign, uh, foreign ministry, rather the archive of foreign policy of Russian empire, so it's a different archive. It's a key place to visit for research on Russian foreign policy, but the two things to remember about it is it takes a lot of time to do any kind of work at ADPRF and success is not guaranteed for, question, for reasons that I will highlight in this presentation. So it's located in Moscow near the foreign ministry, just a short walk from the central um, uh, street of Arbat. 
There's a Wikipedia page about it. Click on it because you'll get an address. Plotnikov Periolok is where it's located. You can get a precise address from this Wikipedia page. And also make sure you remember the name of the archive director, Zaleva Anna Nikolaevna. You will need that in a second. I'll explain why. Okay, so how to get into this archive. You cannot just show up in Moscow, come to the foreign ministry and try to get in. You won't be allowed to do that. You have to write a letter and you have to write a letter ahead of time, preferably a couple of months before you plan to visit. You will get then a permission to work at the archives, a permission that will last for one year, for one calendar year until December 31st. And then you'll have to write a different letter to extend your permission. Or if you change your topic, you again need to write a different letter. A letter should be addressed to Anna Nikolaevna Zaleva, who's the director. You can uh, write it in Russian. I, I don't know if you wrote it in English. Maybe some people have. I'm sure they have English speakers there. Uh, but I've got an email for you here um, where you can send it. So you can send it to avprf at mid.ru, mid.ru. Then what you have to do is just wait. It takes a long time. You might want to call them and ask if they received your uh, request. Uh, it's possible to do that. Now I've got a phone number here for you in a second. Uh, but uh, the problem is that your letter then goes to all kinds of through all kinds of clearances and and согласование uh, is what it's called in Russia. You know, agreement between different uh, state play, uh, uh, stakeholders including including the uh, department, uh, the his historical documentary department of the foreign ministry, which will basically make the decision, but also the phone keepers, the people who actually control the documents uh, in the archives, and FSB, uh, very uh, um, notoriously, I suppose. Right, the letter, what you put in the letter is very important for your sake as it will govern your rules of access. Um, Let's look before we go into that. So to make it to to make you understand what kind of letters to write, let me just explain what's basically there. So uh, the uh, archive is is really well structured, um, and the different funds generally cover different uh, geographical areas. Plus, there's one for foreign minister and deputy foreign ministers as well. So there is no online finding aid. Um, uh, uh, material is arranged by so-called referentura. Referentura is a key word for you. This is a desk. So, for example, uh, there's a Chinese referentura, uh, number 100. Every referentura has a number attached to it. And this material, this, this uh, the Chinese referentura holds uh, materials of the Soviet embassy in Beijing and various consulates in China. The China desk at the foreign ministry, which would include conversations with, for example, Chinese diplomats in Moscow. Um, right. Uh, the materials that were originally classified are preceded by zero. That's a key point. Remember that. Those that do not have a zero in front of them were originally not classified. Now, if you can think about what the kind of stuff that was not classified as secret in the Soviet Union, it's just, just basically propaganda, you know, newspaper cuttings and, and stuff like that. So this is the kind of, you know, this is not the kind of stuff that you really want to spend your time researching at AVPRF. You want to focus on the zero stuff. So the secret, formerly secret, now now declassified materials. Right, the same patterns holds true for other referenturas, so 0 0.29 or 129 for the United States, 79, I think, that's just off, off top of my head. The numbers may well be different, I'm not sure 100%, but I think it's 0 0.79 for Vietnam, um, et cetera, et cetera. So every country has a different referentura attached to it. And also there's a, there's a separate one for the, for international organizations. So for, for the United Nations, for example, there's a separate referentura that goes for that. And a special one for minister, minister, minister of foreign affairs, uh, which I believe is uh, for Molotov, it's definitely zero six, um, but for maybe it's different for some others. Right. Uh, practice. Uh, practice makes perfect before you uh, before you go to even write a letter to the AV AVPRF. Uh, check out this website, agk.mid.ru. It holds thousands of uh, so-called DELA, yeah, or the folders of archival documents uh, from different, from I think four separate referenturas, mainly U.S. Uh, Soviet relations, U.S. British relations, U.S. French, uh, rather U.S. Soviet relations, Soviet British relations, Soviet French relations. What's the fourth one? Maybe the uh, uh, foreign ministry files. So check that out. 
because uh, I, and these materials are from 1941, 1945, they were scanned, uh, digitized as a part of this process of, um, you know, the Russian government wanted to recount uh, the true story behind, uh, behind the Soviet involvement in the Second World War. And this is great stuff for historians. So maybe if your topic just focuses on that area, on that particular period, uh, this is where you want to go because you'll be able to, even without leaving your home, you'll be able to read all this stuff, thousands and thousands and thousands of pages, really, really underused resource. So I would highly recommend that, also free to access. Uh, right, and then you also get the structure of documents because you you can see on each uh, folder you'll see font name, referentura, you'll see uh, uh, folder name, etc., a folder number, uh, and so on and so forth. There's a papka as well, which is a, a, a which which is different from any other uh, a Russian archives. A Russian archives usually go from font to opis to uh, dela, whereas in the foreign ministry you have font. You have opis, then you have papka, and then you have dela. So there's an, also another thing there to pay attention to. Just go to this website and see for yourself. You want to get just a handle, just to get an understanding of how this functions before you go to Moscow so that you properly cite your documents, you know what to order. Uh, also, by the way, if, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, if your proposed topic is wartime relations with allies or U.S.-Soviet relations during the Second World War, you will not be able to actually order these materials at the archive. They'll say we've digitized it all, which is, by the way, not true, but they've digitized a huge amount. So, um, uh, yeah, that's this is where we are with this. Uh, right. You're now ready to write your letter, but before you do, remember, access differs depending on your chosen referentura. Some phone keepers are nicer than others. Some will feed you rubbish, others will bring the real thing. I don't want to go into details. I know which ones, who, 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 who's, who's good and who's not yet, yeah, but I, will, I don't want to share. I don't, you know, I don't want to prejudge as it were. Uh, I just want to warn you that there is a situation. There are lots of phone keepers there and they're responsible for different geographic areas. Some of them are really open and kind-hearted and will help you. And some are just, just don't even start me on this. Right. Uh, so the letters, letter pros and cons, what to put and what not to put in the letter. If your letter is too broad, for example, you want to study Soviet foreign policy from 1917 to 1991, you'll get rejected. They'll say that's too broad. But if you're too narrow, you'll be, uh, you'll face You'll, you'll be facing constraints when ordering stuff at the AVPRF. A sensible chronology is something that doesn't go beyond a couple of decades and also request access to specific referenturas and be sure to include the minister's referentura, although you may not get access because as at least in my recent experience over the last couple of years, they say they don't want to give it up, but sometimes you still get access. But if you don't ask, for it, you'll never get it anyway. So here I've got a sample letter for you uh, in Russian. So you can you can uh, copy and paste this if you want. Well, don't copy and paste, uh, otherwise that will look suspicious. <laughs> Write your own letter, but this is this is what they look like. You don't have to go into great detail. Right. Um, some things to keep in mind: uh, you may not actually get all your preferred referenturas. For example, I already mentioned the foreign ministry's referentura may not be given out. Sometimes they do give it out. You know, you can never tell. You can just keep asking for it. They might actually agree to give it out. Um, once you send your letter by email, wait for about a month and then start calling them because you will want to agree on your arrival date uh, because you'll need to order your propusk or pass. Uh, so before you come to Moscow, you want to call them. If, if your clearance has been received, it will take another couple of weeks to actually arrange for your pass. So make sure that you've got the pass already arranged for and they'll say, oh, you're in the list, you can come. Uh, because otherwise you'll come and they'll say, oh, you're not on the list, you cannot get in. In that situation, if, by the way, if that happens, if you show up at the door and they'll say, and the police there says, you're not on the list, you can always try to call the reading room and say, well, I've received my clearance, why am I not on the list? And they will allow you to go in, so that's fine. But it's still better to just arrange for it ahead of time. Uh, once the pass is ready, come and bring your passport. Uh, also, just a small hint, ahead of time, if you want to save time in Moscow, ahead of time, when you speak to the reading room staff, um, order materials, ask 
to, you know, you, you can out, you can say, I'm, I'm coming next Tuesday. Can you please pre-order stuff for me on this and this and this? And maybe they'll do that. And that means on the day you get there, you'll be able to order, you'll be actually able to look at stuff and order new stuff. This way you'll save some time, just uh, maybe a week by doing this. Right, rules in the reading room. Ordering, you'll have to fill out a slip of paper, be specific there. So don't just say, you know, Soviet foreign policy 91, uh, 1917 to 91, if you won't get anything, but be very specific. So records of conversations of the Soviet ambassador, so ambassador's diary, for example, for specific year, you'll get a whole folder on that and you'll be able to look at this stuff. Um, uh, by the way, sometimes you get a folder like this, and that's just something that's not in the presentation, but some parts of it are closed off. They're stapled together with a little piece of paper um, uh, with staples on the side. This is the material that they want to keep secret um, uh, because it was not declassified. Sometimes they declassify, but they don't declassify. Some, some specific documents are left un uh, still, still secret, and they just close them with uh, A4 sheets of paper. Don't take them off because um, that will spoil your relationship with the archive. So don't do that. Right. Uh, equipment. Thankfully, you don't have to type everything by, write everything by hand. <laughs> I wrote type everything by hand, but it used to be that you would have to write everything by hand uh, years ago, but now they've modernized and you can use your laptop. Uh, but they're difficult about people trying to photograph stuff. So there's no strictly no photographing allowed. Uh, don't do that because, again, this will ruin your relationship with the reading room staff. And that's important to maintain at a positive level. Uh, just make sure you learn how to type in Russian and you have a Russian keyboard ahead of time. This will save you a lot of time. You'll come there and you'll just type away uh, and get a lot of stuff done over weeks, of course. Of course, it'll be much slower than in, in, um, in, in some Western uh, archives or even elsewhere in Moscow. Photocopies, you're basically out of luck. Uh, they, they will allow you to make photocopies, what they call, they call it patemi isledovanya. So in accordance with the subject of your research, 15, 20 pages, it'll, it's, it's free of charge, but you have to wait for weeks and even months to get it. Uh, so unless you're spending months in Moscow, it's not worth bothering with this. Uh, but if you are spending months in Moscow or if somebody can pick this up for you, then, then go ahead and order 15, 20 pages. Yeah, not, nothing to be lost from that. You'll get 15, 20 pages free of, free of charge, but that's, that's all, you know, you cannot push them beyond that. Right. More room, more rules in the reading room. Uh, the reading room staff are your key allies in your research endeavor. If you have good relations with them, never quarrel with them they'll accommodate you by arranging for more and better documents to be brought to you. You say, how can this be? You know, you either have access or you don't. It's not like that. It's not like that. A lot depends on your relationship with the reading room staff. Uh, so be nice. Uh, font keepers, you won't normally meet with them, but they're crucial to the success of your endeavor. It's a hidden myth. You never know, as I mentioned, some of them are good, some of them are not. Uh, in the process, the process of working at AVPRF is unlike anything that you will have at any other uh, Russian archives. Here's an approximate description. First, you order stuff, you fill out little slips of paper, depending on whether they're held in the building or off-site, it may take up to a week to get them. Uh, so use that time to explore Moscow uh, or just have fun, whatever. Read your order. When you get that, you'll get five or 10 folders. Read them, pay attention to classification. If they don't have a zero in front, probably some rubbish anyway. Uh, but don't say it's rubbish. Just say, well, you know, say I'm disappointed. It's not exactly what I needed. I need something more. And you ask again, you order, you may order the same stuff again. And you sometimes you repeat that, you go over and over and over. Um, and by the way, sometimes you just cannot get this material because they're classified. If they're classified, you cannot get them. Yeah, that's just that simple. But in 90% of cases, the materials are declassified. They have been declassified, but you may not still be able to get them because the phone keeper will not want to share them. That's the bottom line. So the, the process works like this. You keep asking, hoping the phone keeper will share the materials and eventually the phone keeper relents and shares the materials or may not relent. And some of them never relent anyway. Uh, so you can spend a month there asking for the same thing. You'll never get it. Or you may actually get it. So you can just repeat this process, ask for other things, you know, add more things, subtract things, and just keep, keep sort of politely pushing for more materials read them, return them, ask for more, ask for the same thing, 
and you may actually get some great, great stuff which nobody has seen before, and it will just uh, make uh, your dissertation a great success. Uh, but don't quarrel with the reading room staff, please. They're very nice people, and they are very much underpaid. Right, that's all I wanted to say about AVPRF. Enjoy your trip there. Um, uh, do your preparation ahead of time. Persevere, don't give up. Uh, in the end, you'll, you, may be, you may just be able to get what you're looking for. Uh, and if you have any questions, just uh, uh, write to me, send an email to me, or find me on Twitter. Thanks again. Hi guys, uh, hello again. I, hello, my last talk was about the Russian foreign ministry and how to get around this. Today I wanted to add a little bit uh, about using Russian language materials in archives other than in Moscow. Now the question is why would you want to do that anyway? Uh, there are two conceivable reasons. The first is that materials you're looking for in Moscow are still classified. This was especially the case until, well, maybe just a few years ago. Uh, when access in Moscow was deeply problematic and scholars like myself would uh, have to go elsewhere looking for uh, opportunities to uh, get to the archives or look at some of the materials that are otherwise closed in Moscow. That's one reason. Uh, another reason is if you have some sort of a regional focus, so perhaps of course, most of the documents may be in Moscow on any topic you want to find about to, to uh, look at, but sometimes uh, the regional archives also hold answers to important questions. Now, the good thing about uh, archives in Russia is that the structure is very similar across the board. No matter whether you're in Moscow or if you go to the regions, you'll find that the structure is very similar um, in terms of the separation between the states and the party archives, although the states and some regions there may be in the same place, but the but the the, the sort of overall structure still is uh, still separated, right? So you will have different uh, different fonts for the government and also for the party. What kind of materials can you expect to find? You know, uh, what can you say to that? Well. I've worked in Sakhalin archives extensively, mine them for month on end. This is because I'm, I am from that region, so I'm very familiar with the local organization there. Uh, and what I found that was that there was a lot of material there on uh, Russia's relations with the Far East, in particular with Japan. Now, I will show, show you just what sort of thing you could find in a place like this so that you have a better idea. I will share a screen for this purpose. This, for example, this comes from Sakhalin Regional Archives in the Far East. You can see that this is a material of the OPCOM or the party committee in Sakhalin. And you can see that this is a department that deals with foreign affairs. Now, just like the party committee in Moscow, the local departments also could have, local party committees also had departments that dealt with foreign affairs. And you think, well, you know, what, what kind of stuff was there? Well, uh, because Sakhalin is at the age of, of Russia, obviously, you know, it had a lot of outward looking agendas. And in this case, you can see that you can find materials there from the uh, Russian consulate in Sapporo. Now, normally this materials would go to Moscow and this is where they went, right? The, to the foreign ministry but also a copy of these materials went to Sakhalin because a lot of these materials dealt with, with something that affected Sakhalin. So you find these materials now in Sakhalin, even though they're close to Moscow. I mean, look at the date, 1982 for this document. This material may, may not actually be declassified at the foreign ministry in Moscow. And actually, I'll tell you more, they don't want to declassify this kind of materials because they feel that uh, Russian-Japanese rela relations are too sensitive a subject because they're unresolved territorial issues. But if you go to the regions, you find the same materials that are completely open.
So exploiting this sort of differences actually allows historian uh, to map, to put together a picture when you don't have sufficient material at hand first. So that's just an example from, from Sakhalin. I've worked across Russia in different, maybe dozen archives. And what I find across the board is that materials in the regions are more open. Getting access is a lot less problematic. There's a lot less sensitivity. So if you are running into obstacles in Moscow, do try to uh, go to the regions and see what you can find. Now, where else can you go beyond Russia? with the Russian language? The answer is anywhere where the Soviet Union, uh, which, you know, it, it, to all, all of those states that were there, that are, that used to be part of the Soviet Union, because all the materials are going to be in Russian. A lot of the materials are going to be in Russian. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people, for example, go to the Baltic states to look at the KGB materials because they're completely open there and they're completely closed in Moscow. People go to Ukraine again for the same reason. The KGB materials are open and they're able to get a lot of fantastic um, insights from those materials, the party materials as well. But uh, my task today is to talk about slightly more exotic archives. And for this reason, I will focus on um, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. I spent a lot of time in Central Asia. Uh, it's not the most natural place to go uh, do archival research because as a lot of people would realize uh, a lot of those countries are dictatorships are not very open and this actually is the case in many places I've tried for example to access archives in Uzbekistan I was completely unsuccessful in Turkmenistan I was also completely unsuccessful and you know there's just no way that you can go to Ashgabat and stop by the archives and get in there there's just no way they should be able to do that but elsewhere in Central Asia things are actually on the brighter side, Kyrgyzstan is an example. Kyrgyzstan is a democratic, a democratic country, uh, relatively open. And this is where I found a lot of materials that were very useful to me as I was doing research on Sino-Soviet relations. Why? Because Kyrgyzstan borders China. And so you would find materials that are reflective, again, like in Sakhalin, you know, Sakhalin borders Japan. So there are a lot of materials about Japan or, or rather about re relations with Japan. In Kyrgyzstan's case, it was relations with China. Uh, what kind of materials? The KGB, military materials, or it's all sorts of things that are way off the radar when you go to Moscow. You just don't get the stuff, but you go to Kyrgyzstan and it's right open there, not just the regional stuff, but also the stuff they sent from Moscow. So I would highly encourage you to do that. Um, let's see if I can share the website now of those materials. I think it's here. Right. So this uh, this here this is here is the website of the of of the Republic of Kyrgyzstan archives. Not particularly great. Not great. There's very little stuff that you can see here. But you can see, by the way, that there's a breakdown of different archives. So this here is the the state archive. This here is the party archive, and this here is the uh, cinema cinema not cinema. What do you call that? The video and audio archive of Kyrgyzstan. So I the one that I used is this the the archive of party materials. Uh, the finding aids are not online, unfortunately, but what you do have online here is the address and the uh, email. It's worthwhile calling them perhaps or sending an email uh, if you do decide to go there. My personal experience of working in the Kyrgyzstan archives is fantastic. I would highly encourage it, com you know, com uh, uh, complete openness at least for me. Now, um, what you might benefit from is uh, some sort of local contacts in Bishkek and American University in Kyrgyzstan, for example, would be very, rather American University in Central Asia would be a very, very good place to start for that. You could get an introduction letter and then you can bring, you know, bring it to the archives and you get access. I had access on the same day but of course you know people change leadership of the archive change political situation changes and uh, you may not be able to do the same thing again I would highly encourage that I had less luck in the Kazakhstan archives this are actually in Almaty and not in North Sultan the capital city um, why did I have less luck there well uh, a lot of materials were deemed sensitive again I was looking for stuff on China and uh, they said that everything on China was classified all the way to the 17th century. So couldn't get anywhere there. But 
here's an interesting thing about it. A lot of other topics they didn't care about. So for example, I found a lot of materials there about the Vietnam War, uh, which I just randomly picked up and uh, I'll share that with you in a second so that you can see the kind of materials, once again, that are available in this archive. It's really counterintuitive, this. So this here are materials that were supplied by the Russian Foreign Ministry to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan, Soviet Socialist Republic in 1966, a top secret document. You would think that this stuff would be declassified in Moscow now because that deals with Vietnam, uh, hopefully, but maybe not. You know, this material would be at the Foreign Ministry. You may not be able to get into the Russian Foreign Ministry, or if you get into it, they may not be giving this material to you. But in again, in the regions, or in this case, in the former Soviet republics, you're able to get materials on the Soviet policy towards Vietnam. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? That's the idea behind multi-archival research. You find stuff in places you don't expect, and I certainly would highly encourage you to do that. So again, just to go back to uh, the list of, uh, to rather to the contact material, uh, to contact information, you can find that information here on the website. It's may it, it may be a good idea to call them ahead of time if you do decide to go there. Uh, I had a mixed experience of working in those archives. Right. Uh, the next one I wanted to talk about is actually beyond the Soviet Union. Can you find Russian language materials beyond Soviet borders, as it were, former Soviet Union? The answer is yes, but. Yes, they are. They do exist. But, but in reality, the vast majority, the vast bulk of materials outside this former Soviet borders is going to be in the local languages. Uh, so you will have limited luck. Uh, the one archive that I wanted to talk about here is the Mongolian archive. Again, you go to Mongolia, the first time I went to Mongolia was in 2003. I was in 2000, 2002, I think, actually. And that was the first person that I know who ever even requested access to this archive. People were very surprised, but very friendly. Mongolia, again, is a democratic open country, and you will have a lot of access um, to, to different materials. Now, what I found is that a lot of materials were in Mongolian, so I had to learn the language in order to get around uh, the archives, and I did. Um, I'm very comfortable with that now. At that time, though, during my first visit, it was very difficult. But that does not mean that you will not find any materials in Russian. You will find a lot of materials in Russian in all of the archives because, of course, relations between Mongolia and Russia were so close. Um, there are state archives in Mongolia. There are party archives in Mongolia, there are also ministerial, ministerial archives. So the setup is exactly 100% the same as what you would see in Moscow. If you're familiar with the setup in Moscow, you can just transpose that to Mongolia. It'll be completely, it'll like being at home for you, except the names are different. Yeah, so it's not, uh, it's not Opis, but it's called Dance in Mongolian, but it's, you know, it doesn't actually change anything. The same thing is an operation in both places. Now, um, sharing the website now. I found the website of the Mongolian, General Mongolian Archival Agency, as it were, uh, which is responsible both for the party archives, the Communist Party or the Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party archives, and state archives. So if you go there, uh, to the website. First of all, you'll find the contact information right here, um, but it's a very bureaucratic place. But by the way, you know, you can just come there. It's not a problem to get access to this archives. It's not like trying to get into the Russian Foreign Ministry archives. You can basically get in on the same day. Nice to have a letter of introduction, uh, especially from a local institution. Look, it's possible to find some academics uh, or, uh, you know, uh, even ask the National University of Mongolia, and they're generally quite welcoming and generally willing to help with this sort of thing. But I think even if you have a letter from your own institution, you'll, you'll do just fine. So if you go here, uh, you can go into, they, they actually have a PDF of all the uh, finding, aid, you know, the whole finding aid here. And you can see you know, that, that, it, I mean, it's a very broad general finding aid, but it starts with things like the Council of Ministers of Mongolia. What kind of stuff would be there? Lots of lots of stuff, mainly about Mongolia, but also about 
the Soviet Union, relationship with the Soviet Union, economic relationship, you know, all kinds of relationship. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of this would be in Mongolian. Now, one thing I wanted to highlight here is uh, uh, actually towards the end of this file, which I read just before this talk, to so be more or less familiar with, with it. Um, and where is it? Right, this here. This is fantastic stuff, actually. I found this is this stuff is some of the most useful stuff that you can find in Mongolia. My interest, of course, was old Mongolian uh, Russian relations. But you see, when the Russians played such a huge role in Mongolia, that it's also very important to look at the Russian materials. If you write about Mongolia, you have to look at the Russian materials. Problematically, a lot of them are not accessible. So here we go. You can actually get them in the Mongolian archives. What are they? They are actually copies of Russian archival materials that the Mongolian archives requested from Russia. They sent whole delegations and photocopied tens of thousands of pages of documents, brought them to Mongolia. They're all stored, and they're all freely available, but they may not be available in Russia. So stuff from Rogaspi, for example, or the foreign ministry or Ghani or even the FSB archives, they have them in Mongolia. Now you can look at this stuff. So here, for example, oh, here, look, uh, there's, um, um, there's material here from 1918 uh, to 1943, covering Mongolia's relations with the Comintern. Are this Mongolian materials? No, they're all Russian materials. Uh, my guess is they all come from Rogaspi, these materials here. Uh, right. You can see here, again, more uh, materials that have been copied from the Russian archives. I mean, it's all materials copied from the Russian archives, lots of lots of stuff. <laughs> There's even material copied from the American archives. So this is American. This is Taiwan. And this is also Taiwan. And uh, again, you know, uh, for this reason, because of the ease of access, Mongolia may actually be a very, very useful place to do research specifically related to Mongolia, obviously. But you will also find a lot of stuff on Soviet foreign policy. Another example is the Foreign Ministry Archive. There is actually a Foreign Ministry Archive website, but it's completely useless, I have to say, although it has nice music. You can click on the music here and listen to a very nice song. Uh, but what you do have on here is this here, under Holbobarik, this here. Uh, this is the contact information of the Mongolian Foreign Ministry Archive. You can send them a fax, you can call them. Really, it's not so difficult to access the archive. You show up, it's just a building next to the Foreign Ministry, bring a letter, if you have a letter, it's better to have a letter and you should be able to access the materials on the very same day. The, uh, the vast bulk of materials is going to be in Mongolian, but not necessarily, not just, not just. So for example, um, I will stop share this, sharing this and I will share something else with you. This here. This, this here, for example, comes from the Mongolian Foreign Ministry Archive, Gadatkirinyam Narhiv. This is font two, or opis or dance. Uh, one and Dela 550, uh, 526, but in Mongolian this is called Hagalachnikch, but otherwise it's the same. By the way, why is it in the Word document? That is because you're not allowed to use camera in the Foreign Ministry Archive, or at least when I was around, uh, when I was there, I was not allowed to do that. So I literally actually typed up this whole, this whole document. You can see multiple, you know, 5,000 words. How long did it take? I'm a quick typer, so maybe this would take me a couple of hours to do that. Uh, by the way, that's why it's useful to, 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 to type fast in Russian. But you can see this material is in Russian. What is this? This is a meeting between um, Mongolian I guess it's deputy foreign minister and uh, a Russian deputy foreign minister about all sorts of things about Russian foreign policy. Let's say Mongolian and Russian diplomats get together in the late 1980s. What do they talk about? Not just Mongolia. They talk about China. They talk about East Asia, Southeast Asia, India, America, anything you want. And this material would not be accessible in the foreign ministry. In Russia, even if it were accessible, you don't, you're don't. you not guaranteed that you will actually have the same kind of perspective because the Mongols, of course, were much more interested about finding out about the Soviet perspective uh, than the other way than uh, you know than uh, than the other way around. So in, in the Soviet version of this conversation, we'll emphasize the Mongolian side's perspective, whereas the Russian Ru Russian or rather the Mongolian version of the conversation emphasizes the uh, Soviet 
perspective. So for this reason, this kind of materials are actually exceptionally useful. So I would encourage you, those people in the Foreign Ministry Archives in Mongolia are lovely people and the materials are quite open. So you can go there and check it out. Going beyond this kind of exotic archives, I just wanted to highlight that you find also Russian language materials across Eastern Europe and Central Europe in places that were a part of the socialist commonwealth. I worked, for example, in Hungary, how is my Hungarian? Zero, but I was able to get a lot of Russian language materials from there. Problematic, but it's still there. It's not, it's not a huge amount, but I was able to get some that was interesting for me. Um, I worked in Bulgaria, I worked in Serbia. Goodness, Serbian archives are all in Serbo-Croat, so you're out of luck unless, um, unless you know Serbo-Croat, in which case they're invaluable, extremely useful. But one that I wanted to highlight is the German archives. Now, I don't speak German. Yeah, my German is very, very bad, but maybe enough to get around and to get into the archives. Once I'm in the archives, then I, sh I, I can actually look at the materials there and find a lot, of, a lot of useful, interesting stuff. Now, there are two archives that I wanted to highlight in Germany that I think will, you will find uh, useful for your purposes. And the first would be Stasi archives. Now, just a second, I, I've lost the file that I was going to share with you. Okay, that's a good example. So Stasi archives are peculiar in the sense that you do not actually get uh, to see the finding aids, but they do bring it out. You, get, you, you talk to them and you say, I'm interested in this or that, and they actually will bring out stuff for you in a troll. You'll be able to study it yourself. Uh, by the way, the archive is located in, in, in Berlin. Again, hugely useful, especially if you speak German, but I don't, and yet, you go to the archives and you find a lot of information in Russian, for example. Well, here's just some, you know, a bunch of files that I was able to photocopy from the uh, Stasi archives. Uh, and uh, I'll just give you one example. Right, a telegram. How about this? This is telegram in, in, uh, that was sent to Stasi. In this case, let's see who was it sent by. Uh, uh, it seems like it was the Hungarian intelligence that sent information to the Stasi. Uh, and it was, you know, about something that that they wanted to share. So Hungarian, Soviet, um, Stasi, you know, the KGB, they all shared information. And their lingua franca was all, always Russian. So they were, you, you are able to find this kind of materials in the Stasi archives. Okay, and the final example uh, uh, is the party archives. So the former SED archives, again, those are in Berlin. Uh, again, bulk, the vast bulk of, my, of materials is going to be in German, but I found by working there, there that uh, information that was sent from Moscow along the fraternal channels is going to be in Russian. And there's usually German translation, but if you speak Russian, like I do, fantastic. This stuff is uh, invaluable because especially a lot of these materials would be classified even now in Moscow. I'll give you an example of this here uh, by sharing this file. If I can find it now. Right, so this. Something is not working, let's see. Okay, this is working now. No, that's still not the right file. I'll just close this. Okay, you should be able to see it now. So this is here a document about the uh, Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev's visit to India in 1973. Well, actually, probably this material now is open or Ghani, but some material is not. It's not going to be, but it's on Russia, in Russian, and it was sent over to uh, Sup, uh, Supmo, or rather to SED, and ended up at Supmo in the party archives, where you can now copy it, unlike me, you actually typed it up. Why did I type it up? Because copying process there is very bureaucratic and problematic and takes a long time. Uh, so I just typed up some of the stuff that I was interested in. So once again, this was a little overview of various exotic archives. You want to do this sort of stuff if, you know, depending on your circumstances, maybe to fill some blank spots in your research in Moscow. Um, 
or maybe because you have original interests, original focus, or maybe it's just because you wanted to travel to Mongolia anyhow, and while you're there, you say, why, why not go to the archives, check out the archives, yeah, archival tourism of a kind, why not? I always try to do that if I'm in some place. So, if you have any questions about this kind of research, please get in touch. I'm on Twitter, you can find my email. Uh, I'll be happy, I'm always very happy to answer uh, queries about archival research in random places. So thanks again for listening. Bye.